So uh, if you guys actually would open with me to Luke chapter 12. Um, If you do not have a Bible, we have Bibles available for you out in the lobby. Please go grab one, help yourself to it, keep it as your own gift. It's God's word. Um, Keep that in your hands. We would love for you to have that. We're going to be reading out of uh, Luke chapter 12, starting in verses 49. After I read this, we'll pray. We'll jump right into it. It's going to be here on the screen. You can also follow along there. This is God's word. It says, I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way, or your adversary may drag you off to the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we uh, devote this time to you as we open up your word um, and and get to see the riches that are within. Uh, We just ask that uh, your word would go out and not return void. Lord, we know that that is the promise of your word. We just ask you to be effective today, that whatever comes out of my mouth, Lord God, would be purposed by you for your mission, for your plan. Lord God, so just uh, use me, prepare our hearts. Lord God, I just ask that as we've sang these songs about your great working, your great work of salvation, that it's already been working and preparing our heart. Whatever we've been going through this week has been preparing us for this very moment. So we submit it to you, and we ask that your spirit would move among us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. amen. All right. We live in interesting times. I don't know if you guys know that. You turn on your news, turn on your phone. And uh, it seems like there is division everywhere. I say it seems like there's division everywhere because there is division everywhere. In fact, I was on a walk about a week and a half ago and um, obviously, it's that time of season. This is that time of year. It's it's uh, every four years we get signs on signs on signs everywhere plastered on the lawn. And I was walking, and there was a political sign that said, "Unity over division." Now you can say what you will about that sign in and of itself, but it struck me that even that sign was divisive. It was saying us, not them. Division can be a bad thing but it can also be a good thing. For example, raise your hand if you like spicy food. Right? After our preaching conference, one of our favorite things to do is to get, uh, there's this really dope uh, spicy, or just this like hot wings place, right? It's right down the road. And so it's Friday, they dismiss us. And before we head home, because the conference is down in Portland, before we head home, it's our favorite thing. We've done it the last couple of years, and I think we're, con- we're planning on continue doing it. Uh, they just have incredible hot wings. So we went up. It was my turn to order. And, you know, I got the spicy buffalo. I'm like, that should be fine. And I was like, what is your, what is your wing of the day? What is, what is that? And they're like, it's barbecue ghost pepper. And I was like, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do half and half, right? So they bring me... The hot wings, we're all sitting there eating together. One of our friends who was sitting there with us starts eating his, and he's like, different, they were different wings, and he's like, this, I feel this in my chest. And I was like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't even get the hot ones, and he's, he's starting to ha- have a problem, and, and he likes spicy food. And so I'm sitting there looking, trying to decipher 
which one is which? And I couldn't tell. I was like, you know, I'll let me start with the milder ones and finish with the hot ones. That way I can at least enjoy the, mo- the meal I'm going to eat. I want to be able to taste my food. So I started eating one and my mouth was on fire. Jordan's like, I've never heard Duncan talk this fast. Um, he's like, I didn't know there was a whole new level to Duncan. I was trying to talk in between breaths. <gasps> um, so uh, after, as I was eating those ones, just like, I'm dying. I was like, trying to keep a brave face because I'm like, if these ones are hot, then the ghost pepper ones are going to melt my face, right? <laughs> and so then finish those ones. I was like, all right, let's, let's eat the other ones. I started eating them. And I was like, oh, these ones, these ones aren't that bad. These ones are actually fine. And I realized I'd eaten them in reverse order. I did start with the hot ones. I did start with the hot ones. But the thing is, I, I couldn't tell the difference. I didn't know which one was which. Now, I don't know well, who doesn't like their food to touch. Is that any of you in the room? Yeah, we got my wife back. In the, yeah, there we go. So what do we do? We get those divider plates, right? Because we don't want our spaghetti to taste like pickles, right? I don't know who eats that together, but someone out there, you know. Those are different divisions as it regards just our everyday preferences. But there's more important things that division can be a good thing when it's present. How about as it regards our safety? How about driving on the freeway? Who's happy that there's a giant concrete block keeping me safe, Lord willing, from oncoming traffic, right? It separates us. One is lanes going this way, there's a dividing line, and there's roads going, or cars going this way at a very, very fast speed. That's safety. What about cleaning chemicals, right? Where do you, where do you store them? Think about it. Where do you keep all your cleaning supplies? Probably, probably, I hope, not next to your cleaning supplies or your uh, cooking supplies. Hopefully not next to your kids' toothpaste. And we do that intentionally because we, we do not want anyone to be harmed. Now, how about division of truth from lies? We hear it. It's popular. And once again, you open up your phone. Mis- this is inf- misinformation. This is misinformation, right? We, everyone wants to say that what the other person is saying is misinformation. Why? Because the truth matters. It's good when we can tell the difference between truth and lies. Truth will always divide itself against lies. And it needs to be understood as I was processing this sign is that unity for unity's sake is dangerous. Unity just for the purpose of being unified is dangerous. Because what's more important than unity for unity's sake is the thing that unifies us. What is the thing that unifies us? That is going to be the most important thing. Is it truth? Is it lies? In Psalm 2, we actually see a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting psalm. It talks about nations that have united in a common cause. And we're going to look at it. Because we think that that would be a good thing. But let's look at it. Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. What these nations had unified over is their common hatred and rebellion against God. But also, as we see in this text, God has shown that though they might unify against him, he has set his son as king in opposition to these kingdoms. 
And at the end of the text, we see a blessing pronounced for those not against the Son, but for those who take refuge in him, right? We have those who are against him and those that take refuge in him. Which leads me to my main point for our text today that we're going to be looking at in our Luke text. If you're taking notes, this is our main point for the day. Jesus has drawn a line in the sand. Now is the time to get right. So, we've been going through a, a series in Luke. That's why we're pulling this passage from Luke. We've been going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the gospel of Luke, where Luke has written an orderly and carefully investigated account of the life and ministry of the life of Jesus. The purpose for this written account was to strengthen the belief of the reader about the truth about who Jesus was and what he accomplished and who he is. And last week, Pastor Greg did a great job. He, he, he took us through where Jesus had commanded his disciples to stay ready. He told his disciples, stay ready, stay on mission, so that when Jesus returns, there would be blessing, rather than returning to find those who started to abuse um, the people around them and, and started to become unfaithful and, and grew lackadaisical in, in their following of uh, the, the master. And those who did that, those who were unfaithful, ended up receiving punishment instead of blessing. Now today... Jesus is going to draw a line in the, te- in the sand and we'll see that Jesus himself is that line. Jesus himself is the line in the sand. Jesus is the divider of mankind. That those who are in Christ will be divided against those who are not. And we're going to unpack that. So if you're taking notes, today's message is titled, Jesus, the line in the sand. We're going to jump right into it. Our first two uh, verses of today's text. We see Jesus explain what he was sent to do. And we're going to see a, a kind of a tone shift from Jesus of urgency and anticipation for the mission that he was sent to accomplish. Let's look at it. Verses 49 and 50, Luke chapter 12. Jesus says, I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Now, I don't know if he was still out there. I saw it was raining, so maybe he's, maybe he's not. Um, like three hours ago, coming from Costco, on my way to church, there was a father and a son and they were holding a sign, right? Like I said, it's that season, so everyone's outside holding signs. And I was a little confused by the sign. Because the sign that both the father and son, they each had their own little sign they were waving, said, Giant Meteor 2024. And I was like, that's an odd name for a person. <laughs> I was like, that does, what a unique name. It is, it is Lacey Washington, but what a unique name. And then I realized that is not what they were asking for. There's a lot of people, and I don't, I don't know who they are. If you're here, what's up? I'm, I'm glad you made it if you happen to be here in the room. But... They were out there, they were rooting for a fireball from the sky to be what takes care of us. That's what, that's what that sign was saying. We need a fireball in the sky to come down and deal with the mess that we have going on. And here's Jesus saying, I have come to bring fire on the earth. I've come to bring fire on the earth. We see fire all throughout scripture used as a sign of judgment. It is sometimes a a metaphorical fire. Sometimes, if you've read your Bible, it's a literal fire. At other times we see fire used as a sign of refinement and of light. Just like gold goes through fire so as to become more pure in its substance. In the context that Jesus is speaking on here, I think that the, the better understanding of what he means by fire is this idea of refinement. It's more fitting to the purpose of what Jesus is getting at. That is refinement of the world to make it more pure, to separate the dross from, from gold. Which, 
refinement does have a, a piece of judgment in it. You're, you're trying to go, which part is gold that we should keep? Which part is dross that should be removed? So this is refining fire. And he, and he says, he's come to bring fire. And the next part, of, he says, and how I wish it was already kindled. How I wish it was already kindled. Jesus, his tone, and literally, it's not even just a tone. It's just what he's saying. He's like, I wish it was already happening. I've come to do this. And I wish it was already happening. He continues to express this further urgency for his mission, saying he has a baptism to undergo and how the sense of urgency he is under until that thing is accomplished. Now, if you've been following along with us, um, almost over what? It is over a year now. Uh, in, in this Luke series, we know that Jesus has already been baptized. Jesus is saying this after he got baptized. So he's not referring to being baptized again. But he's saying that there's something that he must go through. That just like in baptism, which is kind of cool that this is the text for today, and we happen to be having uh, baptisms today. God's just so amazing. That just like in baptism, your whole body is subject to go into the water and then out of it. So Jesus has something that his whole body is going to go through. It's going to go into and out of again. I think Jesus using this imagery of baptism is also very beautiful. Because it's this prime example of how our baptism is our outward expression of our belief in Jesus. It's how we identify with him. It's how we tell the world, I'm with him. That just as Jesus died, was buried and was raised again. So we go into the water and come up again, signifying to our old self being dead and gone and our new self being raised again in Christ. Now, after today's message, if you put your faith in Jesus, whether that was a long time ago or even right now, and you haven't been baptized, that is the next step. Once you've put your faith in Jesus, the next step is to get baptized. And so here's the deal. You may have not come thinking you were getting baptized today. But if the Lord puts that on your heart, we will not stop you. We have extra towels. We have extra clothes. We will figure it out. So Jesus has this urgency to complete his mission. But this urgency, one can imagine, is one that Jesus is looking forward to being on the other side of. Jesus, he knows what's coming. He knows what's ahead. And he's like, man, I'd love to get this done. But I think it's very important for us to remember that Jesus was born to die. Jesus was born to die. And not in a peaceful family lying next to the bed while I slowly take my last breath type of way. That is not how Jesus was going to go out. Jesus was born to die as the lamb slain for our sins. The one who would take our place, who would bear God's wrath do our sin, and he would do so via the most horrific method of execution known to man in that day. And honestly, I don't want to I don't want to test it now. I would not want to have any competition. Cuz what it was is to be beaten and whipped and mocked, spit on, and eventually hung as a criminal on pieces of wood, supported by nothing but the nails driven through your hands and your feet to these wooden boards. Every day of Jesus' life brought him one step closer to that moment. And one can imagine the anticipation that Jesus would have felt knowing where he was headed. Sometimes I have anxiety thinking about a coffee meeting I have later. Okay? Maybe a, a tough conversation I have to have. And here's Jesus. He knows what's coming. We know that Jesus did end up on that cross. He was obedient. He went to the cross. And that just before he died, he said some of the most amazing words that a Christian can hear. And I can imagine also the breath of relief from Jesus. 
Let's look at it in John 19. Later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge up on a stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus said, it is finished. Imagine that. Can you think about that? What he had finished, what he had accomplished was the thing he had been sent to do. And now it was done. He's still hanging on the cross, but he recognizes that he had fulfilled what he had been sent to do. And imagine the relief. Imagine the relief Jesus had having been obedient to the point of death, death on a cross, then now he can proclaim it is finished and surrender his spirit to the Father. Those words, it is finished, signify that Jesus paid for our sins, appeased the wrath of God due our sin, and was successful. And we know that he was successful not just because Jesus said so before he died, but because we have proof. God raised Jesus from the dead, proving that Jesus was who he said he was. He proved through the resurrection that Jesus had accomplished the mission of making atonement and salvation possible for anyone who puts their faith in Jesus. Those are all Amazing, amazing things. But in our text today, Jesus is still anticipating all of those things. He's still headed towards all those things. He's still taking one step after step towards Jerusalem, knowing what's coming. So I think that that is that anticipation and urgency that we're starting to see in Jesus' tone here. So after expressing that he had come to bring fire and that he was urgent to accomplish his mission, he starts to clarify to those around him the purpose for which he was sent. This is going to be more in line with clarifying that fire that he was speaking about. Let's look at it. Verses 51 through 53. He says, Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No. I tell you, but division. From now on there will be five in one family, divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Jesus says there's going to be real division. And honestly, out of the gates, this seems like a shocking thing for Jesus to say. I don't know about you. it, It is a shocking thing. I came to divide I didn't come to bring peace on earth, but division. But notice what he said, on earth. Jesus out of the gates saying something shocking. Jesus, who is often referred to as what? The prince of peace. Jesus, the one in whom we can have peace that surpasses all understanding. Those are all true things. Those are all true things. Jesus is not saying that he doesn't bring peace at all. Because as we saw through his death on our behalf, he made it so that we can have peace between God and man. Through him. That as we have peace in Christ, we can also have peace with one another. Jesus in many ways has brought peace. But it's in the same way that that very statement divides the room, causes division. There's lots of statements like that in the world, right? Pineapple on pizza is okay. (laughs) Apple is better than Android. Cake is better than pie. Jesus is Lord. 
Jesus is saying the mission that he has been sent to accomplish is going to draw a line in the sand and you can only be on one side of it or the other. There are those who are in Christ and those who are not. There are those who believe in Christ and what he's accomplished and unbelievers. The gospel is a fire. It separates, it divides, it divides truth from lies, light from darkness, and life from death. As believers, we know the division that our faith has caused from the people around us. There's been division that we've been happy about, right? Man, I'm so great that the Lord has freed me from this sin. That I am no longer a part of that thing. Maybe we're separated from the, the crowds that encouraged them. The people who were, who, were, who were bringing destruction into our lives in a way that we allowed them to have influence. We've been divided against family members who mock and scoff at our belief and trust in Jesus. It's a real thing. Of course, our desire is not to be divided against those people. Ultimately, it's right to stand up for truth. I think it's why we hope to also see them cross that line. It's why we hope and pray that they cross the line, cross the line, come over to the other side and find life and light and truth. The world doesn't offer that. The world doesn't offer that. It will lie to you. If you followed that any little bit, you know they're liars. I think, honestly, it's why it's speaking as a young person, it is nice to listen to, no offense, old people, because they've followed those lines a little bit longer, and they're like, oh, and I have a lot of backtracking to do. So we're young, a good positive thing that we could do is just listen to them. They're trying to save us from backtracking and pain. Because they know that what the world offers them is a lie. <coughs> Jesus makes it clear that the work that he has set out to do will divide people. That is nations, cities, workplaces, schools, and as he shows here in the most intimate way possible, even families. This is a good thing to remember because in a day where the world says live your truth, but then is very upset when you claim to have found it in Jesus, we need to know that this is what Jesus told us to expect. Jesus is saying no surprises. No surprises. He tells us the truth. Isn't that crazy? He tells us the truth. And Jesus is the line in the sand. Jesus is the great divider of mankind. Everything rises and falls on what you do with Jesus. Period. Your eternity, right? Because we say everything, we're like, okay, well, I have work on Monday and I have my family and I'm trying to feed them. I'm trying to do, like, we can go through everything. But your eternity, much longer, can't change that. rises and falls on what you do with Jesus now. There is no middle ground. You either believe in him or you don't. I wrote in my notes this week, you either unified against him or unified by him. And which side you are on is one of the most important things you will ever consider or one of the most important choices you will ever make in your life. Yep. Jesus then goes on with a rebuke. If you're taking notes, you can write, what time is it? What time is it? We're going to be looking at verses 54 through 56. He said to the crowd, 
When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain. And it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot. And it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth in the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Okay, Jesus. Jesus rebukes the crowds by saying you can literally interpret the weather, the weather patterns. And so know what the weather is going to be like. Yet you don't recognize the time that is at hand. Last week, we see Jesus warn the crowds. All of last week's message was Jesus warning the crowds to be ready, to be found working when the master returns. As much as all of that spoke to his second coming, Jesus returning, What's interesting is that in this passage, Jesus says, you people of God weren't even, aren't even ready for my first coming. You weren't even, you weren't even ready. He said, be ready, because he will come back. Next thing, I have come to bring fire. He's here. He says, you don't know what time it is. They didn't. Recognize or know the times. They were guilty of the very things Jesus had warned them to not be doing. That is mistreating each other and growing lazy in their service to God. Now Jesus shows up and is sounding the alarm, having just said, I have come and you don't even see it. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I went and saw one of my favorite bands at the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle. And as we were walking down the street, um, there was this very nice Tesla being towed. I was like, that is a bummer. And we're walking by it, and you wanted to feel bad, but you couldn't. Because the entire street was under construction. And literally down the road, the entire sidewalk on both sides had big signs that said, no parking any time. No parking any time. No parking any time. No parking any time. We were just walking one after another after another. No parking any time. This Tesla, I don't know why, thought that maybe those signs weren't telling the truth. Maybe this is one of those not any times. I don't know what it was. But it does not apply. They tried parking there, and they were getting towed. And the person was outside with their car on a lift, Begging the tow person, please no, no. It's hard. You could want to go like, man, I, I could see where I'd want to show them compassion. But bro, the signs were everywhere. The signs were everywhere. You couldn't miss them. You had to ignore them. They were everywhere. She pleaded, but it was too late. It was going to be hauled off. She did not heed the signs. Jesus is going to continue his rebuke in the next section, if you're taking notes, right? Get right with man and get right with God. Those are two different things. Get right with man and get right with God. Jesus is going to offer practical advice about settling disputes. While it is practical and applicable to our everyday lives, I believe it is also applicable and a practical warning concerning our eternity. Okay, so I, I, we're going to kind of look at this thing. Saying the same thing, we're looking at it in two ways. It's going to be in verses 57 through 59. Jesus is giving us a little bit of a practical parable. He says, Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you were going with your adversary to the magistrate, try hard, try hard. Can we say that together? Try hard to be reconciled on the way. 
Or your adversary may drag you off to the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So Jesus once again calls into question their judgment capabilities and asks, why can't you judge what is right? Can't you judge what's right? He tells them that when they're having an issue with someone, to try and do everything they can to settle that dispute before they go before the judge. Because if they don't, if they don't settle it before then, if they can't settle it before they go to the judge, they're going to have to bear the full sentence that the judge is going to bring against them. Practical wisdom, super practical. We all know this to be true. Think about it when you were a kid. If you had a sibling or a friend and you accidentally hurt them and they start crying very loudly, how do you respond? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please don't. Please don't tell that. Please don't tell mom. Please, please, it's okay. You're right. I didn't even hear you that bad. It's fine. You know, it's right. We do not want them to go get the judge. We do not want them to go bring in the higher authority because we know if they do, if we can't settle it here, I know I'm going to have problems over here, right? So we know this. Kids know this on an instinctual level. And this is wisdom. Deal with your issues before taking them to the court. Do everything you can. Try hard. Be intentional to try and make an amends to reconcile. I can tell you what that's going to look like. But I can tell you, Jesus tells us to try hard to reconcile before being taken to court. Things will be much better off in the long run if you can get things settled in-house. But here, Jesus, I believe, coming off the back end of talking about his return. Remember last week? He's talking about his return. And his now arrival is alluding to the most important judge that we will ever stand before. That being God himself. Every single one of us will one day stand before our creator and give an account of our life. And I need to clarify, it's not just for story time. Not just for story time. But it's going to be to see if we lived up to the standard that God has called us to live by. Scripture tells us, and we all know, that we have fallen short of the glory of God. That all have sinned. You might know some cool people. You know some great people. You don't know any sinless people. So what does that mean? That if any of us stand before God, stand before our creator, we will be judged guilty. It's true. And I will just do a couple of these just, just to make sure, just to make sure we're not counting ourselves out here. Ever stolen anything ever for any reason? Committed adultery? Lusted? Have you ever lied ever? Have you ever slandered or gossiped about an image bearer of God? Ever? One time? You could go on. All of us have failed to meet the standard. The standard is perfection. Perfection. That is the standard. We failed to meet that standard and we have wrath stored up to our sin. And if you were to die tonight, you would stand before him guilty and condemned. That is the bad news of being on the opposing side of Jesus. 
Here's what's amazing. Is that there even is good news. He could have just let us oppose him and sent the fireball. He could have done that. He didn't. He went to the cross and gave us good news. God has made a way for us to settle our accounts before that time comes. That is by trusting in the Lord Jesus and believing in his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. Scripture says that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus tells the truth. His word tells the truth. Jesus in his death has paid the debt you owe for your sin. That's good news. So that for all who believe in him, when they stand on that day before the judgment throne of God, they will not stand condemned. They will stand justified and righteous before God and not because of you and not because of your works, not because of any good thing you did, but because of the life and death that Jesus has given to you. And that he took your life. And the death you should have died. On the cross. There is a way to be right with Jesus. There is a a way to be right with God. And it's through and in Jesus. Now is the time. There are no second chances after you die. And I want to repeat that. There are no second chances after you die. We saw it a few weeks ago. None of us are promised tomorrow. And none of us know the time we go. Hebrews clearly says, let's look at it, 9, verses 27, uh, 28. Just as people are destined to do what? Die once and after that, to face judgment. That's us. But here's the good news. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This is a great text coming off the back end of last week. Jesus says, do what? Wait! Be found working and watching because I am coming. He does not lie. He tells the truth. So the question for today is, are you ready? What side of the line do you stand on? Have you settled your account with your creator? Because if you haven't, the good news is now is the time. Right now. While there is breath in your lungs given to you by that same creator. Now is the time. And here's the deal. Just as in those days, those people struggled to see what was right in front of them. And I pray to God. I pray to God that today that is not you. That that is not me. That we are not among them in that way. That now on this side of the death and resurrection of Jesus, he's accomplished it. There's no anticipating it. It's done. It happened. That you would see the times that you are living in and the opportunity that is now before you. Before it's too late. Because Jesus has drawn the line in the sand and he tells us that now is the time to get right. Now, as believers, if you already have made it right with your judge, with your creator, and and, and call on him as father, first of all, we need the reminder. Just straight up. We need the reminder. We need the reminder that we need to be ready. We need to uh, have the reminder to stay watching and to know what time it is, who we look to, what Jesus has come to accomplish. We need to remember that. We also have the opportunity 
and the command to share this. But now is the time. But Jesus has drawn a line, and now is the time. We have an obligation and a command to share that. And here's the deal. Obligation, command. Oh, that sounds like a lot. It's good news. You're not delivering bad news. You're delivering good news. That's not on you. You tell them that there's a way to cross the line, to find life and light. That it exists in a world that does not. And I can think of no better way than by setting an example as believers and obeying the first practical implication of what Jesus has told us to do, which is do what you can to reconcile with your adversary. Do what you can. Try hard. Make every effort to settle with your adversary. That as we have been shown grace and reconciliation, that we now get to do that for others. So as a believer, ask yourself, is there someone you need to make it right with? Jesus has not only made a a way for us to be right, but has shown us the way of reconciliation, laying down our life. He has set the example for making things right. And he commands us to make it right with our adversary. And here's the deal. That could be a literal enemy. Or maybe today, that's your spouse. Your brother and sister. Your friend. The Lord commands us to make every effort to settle the issue. And I need the band to come up, please. So we should obey. It doesn't mean that we will be successful in our trying to reconcile. But he does tell us to make every effort. We look at it in Romans 12, 18. It won't be here on the screen. But it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Okay. He just, he just says, try. Matthew 5, 23, 26. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Funny enough, this is in Matthew. Guess what he says next? Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. penny. He uses the same parable on the back end of that. Not only is this just a command, but think about the example that this sets as representatives of the God of reconciliation. That we would initiate reconciliation. Just like God initiated reconciliation with us. Think about the doors for evangelism that can open that we seek to reconcile because of the grace and mercy shown towards us. And now we can share that with others. We set an example in the way that we treat each other. So I want us to also consider that maybe you're seeking reconciliation will also open the door to more conversation about the most important reconciliation that everyone needs. And that is found in Christ Jesus alone. We're not the only ones who need to hear this good news. Amen? Would you guys please stand?